Hi. Before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about some bonus content from Spotlight On. Head over to spotlightonpodcast.com slash blog and check out Bonus Tracks, the official blog of this podcast. There you'll find special material exclusive to the website, including music recommendations, artist interviews, essays, and more. Have a look. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on Canadian producer and sound artist Michael Scott Dawson. Michael joined us to mark the release of his third solo album, Find Yourself Lost, a collection of country-adjacent, western-themed ambient recordings issued by Toronto label We Are Busy Bodies. The album is ethereal, but without becoming space music. It's steeped in melody, tape loops, and Michael's own field recordings. He's made an emotional, never-sterile ambient work. You can visit this episode's show notes for links to the music. Despite the album's personal nature, which Michael discusses in this talk, Find Yourself Lost is also the first time he's included other musical contributors to one of his solo albums, something we also learn about in this conversation. So now it's my pleasure to bring you Michael Scott Dawson. Something that was very sort of intriguing to me was you blew up a misconception or a bias for me, which was a lot of fun. It's always fun to have that done. So I first became familiar with you through your solo work, the more ambient textural type recordings. And I knew that you also participated in the free jazz world. And I thought, oh, okay, the ambient work is a counterpoint to the free jazz work. Great. I get that narrative. I brought a preconception of what free jazz was in terms of being extraordinarily dynamic, bombastic, those types of framings. And yet I found that it wasn't entirely dissimilar from the work you do as a solo artist. And so I wonder maybe as a way to start, could you talk a little bit about, I guess, the theme or the use of sonics across the different projects you do? How do you think about improvised music in a collective setting versus what you do as a sonic composer? Maybe that's where we could begin. I think a lot of the time for me, when I, especially when I'm working my own stuff, like I'm very much just responding to sounds that I'm making. You know, I've sort of found this habit of not a habit, I've grown a practice, I should say, probably I've tried to make time each day to sit down and just experiment a little bit and make some things. And inherently, like, I grow this sort of sonic palette that I have lots of enough sketches that I hone in on a few of those pieces and that inevitably becomes an album to laying on those pieces. And I think it's a personal connection. It's sounds that are just pleasing. I'm just drawn into them. I'll often be in the day, sit down and make something and feel nice about it and walk away and sit down the next morning, put on headphones and just be like repulsed or turned off. Like, oh, like that's not, it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't stick with me as it did. And I think that in the the jazz realm, which I very much, I think, I feel like an imposter sort of daily working on that project as well. I think that it's a similar scenario, right? Where I think I'm really trying to lean on uh, elements of subtle beauty and just the distillation of sounds. And sometimes that's like the crackling of a spit valve that shouldn't be musical, but it can be this textural piece. And if I can find a way to weave that through some pedals and processing where it can open up and be more of this pastoral or like cloudy sound i don't know it's not that's not a great descriptor but i'm really i'm just interested in that evolution of sound and i think that ultimately both of them for me it's just sort of this amorphous organic compositions i like them to feel resolved at the end but i like just sort of to get lost in them and drift with them and so certainly working in the peace flag it's having such enormously talented collaborators where sort of someone hands you this thing that's inherently beautiful already and my job is how can I not wreck it but how can I play with play with the textures that come from within it or how can I reprocess this and again build that sort of sonic palette that I just find soothing I guess that's the word I'm looking for I've really tried to put this into words currently so struggling a little bit but that's (laughs) (laughs) 
listen, full disclosure, you know, the, the two things that I always commit mentally to staying away from and the two things I always wind up getting into <laughs> are discussion of process and description of sound. <laughs> but I find them both fascinating. So I, I apologize. <laughs> no, it, it's totally fair. Like when I first worked on my first couple solo records, and again, I had to put out the Peace Flag record, like, I found that I needed to less describe the sound, but I felt like I needed to contextualize what I was making or maybe why I was making it when I shared it with folks. It just sort of, maybe it's an insecurity, but maybe I just think that it's better perceived if you have some sort of element of context of what this thing is you're making so that it's not, it's not just a soundscape or you've made it with these instruments or what have you. And so I appreciate the question, even if I'm not the most eloquent uh, response to it, but yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this, that, that that's an interesting point you make around having that context or descriptor, especially for people that know you. And I wonder, that brings up a few things for me. One is, would you feel the same if you were making, say, a rock record or a pop record or a guitar-driven record? I mean, I guess the flip side of that question is, do you feel the need to explain it because it is perhaps a different type of music than maybe what people normally encounter or listen to, or a different type of music that they might expect from you knowing you? I think it might be a little bit of both. The latter there, I don't think anyone that knows me is, is radically surprised that I've sort of gone down this path or that I've leaned, you know, to more subdued and quiet, but also experimental realms of music making. But just the same, I think if it was a rock record, I think it's just inherently more palatable. Folks put it on and compare it to something if they have that point of reference, what have you. And yeah, I think it was, it felt more like an invitation, like this is what I've made and here's how and why I've made it. I invite you to. Take it for what it is and whether or not it resonates with you. I mean, that's out of my hands, certainly, but it just, I think, really became a bit of an invitation. Not dissimilar from maybe an artist statement in an artist catalog or at a gallery showing, just something to set the context for what it is you're about to experience. I think that's exactly it. I think that's quite accurate. I mean, that's actually my background. I mean, in, in university, I studied fine art. And so, a lot of how I look at what I do and how I present it probably comes more from that world. I don't really have any proper kind of music trading and or understanding shy of just playing in bands since I was a kid and making weird little experiments in my bedroom when I was a child. Yeah, I think it's certainly that. It's laying it out. This is what I've made and why I've made it and I've made it with some intent. And that if that sounds completely ridiculous too, I appreciate that. But for me, this is where it came from, you know, and where I'm headed with it. How does your fine art training or your fine art studies, what do you bring to the music making here? I mean, just as a somewhat lay person to fine art, if I had to put you in a context, I'd say that the music is impressionistic. Is that fair? Like, what, what do you overlay from the art world? I would agree with that, I think. I'm using sounds, I think, that I connect with and relate to a specific place or feeling. I certainly can't project that on others, but that's where it's coming from. And I mean, I don't know. I was actually thinking, I have this memory. I don't know what year I was, several years into university and in, in a painting class. The context is that now I often will just build like this sort of simple loop that's almost nothing and I'll just sit with it and let it, it'll just let it play in headphones while I'm doing other stuff. I want my day. Just That's often where I'll end up building a song from and I'll start with this piece that feels like that and I'll have these like fairly, it's a loop. So it inherently it's rigid rather than from a tape or whatever. It's maybe not in a logical time signature, but then I'll put these organic elements on top of it. And I have this memory, you know, of, uh, I was in this painting class. It was like this, we were free to pay whatever we wanted and I had this canvas sitting in front of me and just literally was just sitting there blank, no idea. And I just found myself just staring at this canvas. And I started to like, there's like light hitting this plain stretch canvas and see some of the details and some of the little fine weave in it and stuff. And I just couldn't, I couldn't escape it. And so I sat there for like probably a class and a half and always working around me like crazy. And then I went to work where I got out the gesso and I found the canvas. And then I was just painting to recreate this blank canvas, like using paints and trying as best I could of memory to start with this painted blank canvas that looked like a blank canvas and professor coming around and seeing me starting to layer the organic ideas on top of it and be like you know that you need to like prime this canvas before you start and it missed the process of me laying it out and i think that's sometimes the same philosophy i have a little bit of music where i want it to almost disappear before i have little things happen on top of it i want to be able to live with it but i also like to be drawn into those nuances and do you find that you take away a lot during your sort of sonic building process is that an element of this to you absolutely yeah for sure especially in the solo stuff the opt-in and the, the peace flag stuff someone will send me sort of a, a fully realized idea or a few takes of an improvisation of an idea 
but all my own pieces. It really is. It's, it's a lot of finding that kind of underpinning element and then just playing and laying on top of it and often getting with cutting cassette loops and building little pieces on top of it that in some ways it would be as simple as just plucking a single note, but I think that there adds, there's a sonic texture that comes from just playing with how I arrive at that point. And so, yeah, I'll sort of build up and build up until I know I've gone too far and then often strip it away and then just allow myself to zoom out and you're adding layers. Despite the fact that I'm recording to a computer, I'm still adding layers. And so there's an inevitability that what I played last is sitting in the most forefront. And so then my, the second round of editing kind of once I piece together what's there is, is this really what I want to be the most accessible element of this piece? And so often what happens is that very first layer that I was drawn to reverts to being the loudest piece. And then some of those other pieces I've added get lost in the distance a little bit. And it keeps it from being too melodic and or structured, if, if you will. Where the melody or the recognizable structure is almost a distraction to the sonic world. Yeah, that's my hope. That's absolutely my hope. I do love when something happened that, that draws you back in. Yeah, it re reengages you with the listening experience, but I also don't want it to be a priority or you just, you need to follow this thing as if it was a vocal line or something. It's more of yeah. just like, here's a fraction of a melody. In the process, as you described it, then that, that implies to me that everything down through assembling the final mix is part of the compositional process. Is that accurate or do you use a, does someone else mix for you? No, I just mix everything for both those projects myself, just at home here. And yeah, it really is. I think that my artistic practice, if I had to say, which is a word I'm trying to cling to and something I shun from my whole, I think I, it took me till this point, like probably this morning to, to allow myself to consider myself an artist. But it's, it's this last couple of years of setting aside daily time to work, work on something. And I often just get up and answer some emails and have a cup of coffee and put a half an hour in before I get on with my day and inevitably lynch in the back of your head and you want to get back to it. But that part of it to me is really just exploratory. And I think that a lot of the composition, most of the composition comes from the mixing process. And, and uh, yeah. more often than not, that mixing makes me then want to revisit what that composition looks like and I'll add another layer and I'll find a new little sound that I wish carries forward in the rest of the records when I'm going back through it all. And so it's, uh, I think that's part of the process for me. I think what, what I enjoy about it is that I'm probably overcomplicating for what the end result is, but that's it's the the element of fulfillment I find for myself in doing it that way. The analogy I, I'm tempted to draw at the risk of putting words in your mouth is that the mixing process is very much akin to the arrange like that that's the arrangement. And your form of composition mixing is equivalent of arranging. A hundred percent, yeah. That's I think that's yeah. exactly right. The other piece that that stands out for me a lot in listening not only to this record, but to your last few works and hearing what you said about this notion of an art an artist statement. There is a narrative around each of your albums, or at least a narrative spark. Whether that's post hoc or not is something I'd love to ask you about, especially given how you say you live with some of the sounds, some of the repetition you develop that way. I'm really curious about not just the process, but the genesis of a project. Is it this theme and concept that you can't get out of your head that you then develop a sonic world around? When do the narrative and the sonics converge? To me, it's sort of it just happens naturally in that early stage where I'll, I've finished up one project and set it aside and set it off to be pressed in all those months that you lose. And in the ether, waiting for a record to come out, I just find myself going back to sit at the computer. And and just as I'm just beginning to make those sounds, before I'm even thinking about a record, you know, I think the last record I had 45 sketches or something as ideas and come to a dozen of them to fully realize them. And as you do that, from that very base level, it just starts to remind me of a feeling or I start to chase a feeling a little bit. There's an element of sentimentality, I think, for me, just learning to really appreciate where I came from and where I grew up. And it, it's helped me kind of revisit some of those memories, I think, is sort of anyone who grows up in a smaller center and, and your interests aren't necessarily present in your surroundings when you're growing up. There's a certain element of, of resentment, you know, so, I mean, I love my friends and family, but I didn't necessarily ever appreciate the sense of place and I think the beauty that comes with being in a place that's so quiet and so peaceful, you know, and you can just drive those few blocks to the edge of town and it's literally just sprawling wheat fields and sky as far as you can see. And I think that's become a big theme is kind of revisiting those things and reevaluating a little bit of what I put in a stake of my own identity. You know, I mean, I came out of a smaller town invigorated by something that definitely wasn't looking for tranquility and peacefulness, you know, like, I mean, I grew up listening to very loud music and 
skateboarding and that sort of world. And so now kind of to go back and revisit those places and spend time with family, it's become a spark, I think, for a lot of it. And I certainly worry it's going to grow redundant as I look for other, other sources of inspiration, but I just keep being drawn back to that thus far. One of the things that I read when preparing for our time together was this line that stood out for me around, I just took a subset of the language out that I wanted to ask you about. And it was this idea, it said, of reconciling your relationship with music and technology. The word there that was loaded for me was reconcile, and I wasn't sure how to read that, if it was a harmonize, if it was a reckoning. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that phrase meant. On both sides, I think it really it means to make peace with, and uh, it's nevertheless become a reinvigorated relationship, I think. But at, that, at those points, those early days, when I started working on these projects, I'd been playing in, you know, indie rock bands for years and touring what felt like constantly, you know, I mean, a couple hundred days a year often on the road. And, and I had really, I'd fallen heavily out of love with performing. What used to bring me sort of the most joy in being a musician was performing and being on stage with a band and, and that shared experience and sharing that energy and just connecting with an audience. And I just couldn't find myself doing that. And so I'd become really frustrated and I thought I was done playing music. On one hand, I just had lost interest, really. I wasn't terribly, it wasn't really spark to make music. And then on the flip side of it, going back now 12, 13 years, I uh, had started to make a solo record, which was so long ago, which is a bit derivative of this. It was a little more sort of experimental beat based, but certainly sort of an ambient mellow project using a Finner Rose piano and some stuff years and years ago. And I was fairly deep into it. And was a steep learning curve and kind of working through it as a student with very, very little expendable dollars. And what happened was that my uh, computer literally caught fire, like it filled the room with smoke and melted and I wasn't wise enough to have a hard drive. And so I, at that point, I, I like was like, I've washed my hands of this world of recording and building records myself. And so we started another band a few years later. And in that realm, certainly we just throw up in the studio and kind of participate. Here's my synthesizer contributions. And I'd write other lyrics for that project and, and I could be away from the piece. And so... It just happened naturally where I had set up a little home recording piece and was really fooling around. And as I did it, I found quite enjoyment in it. And I built this, again, this palette of sounds that I liked that it never really became that first record. And it made me fall back in love with both you know, the creative part of being a musician and also, uh, I guess, exploiting the technology in some ways. I'm not, I'm really not leaning on a computer for anything beyond capturing what I'm putting into it. But instead, I have to put my trust in it to this that I'm not going to wake up one day and my hard drive's crashed and that project's gone. And if it is, I think I'm okay with that now. At the time, it was a little heartbreaking and I was probably a little more... I think that this project means more to me now than that did, but at that point in my life, I think it it just hurt more. You know, it, it was this thing that I really felt like I'd put myself on the line and I was... I'd built up this thing to do this and it fell apart. Anyway, that's a convoluted answer, but I mean, that's really what it is. It's like a, through this, truly just playing and experimenting and really playing just... In, in the playful sense, not in the, you know, sitting and shredding on a guitar, but just truly just being playful in a little studio space. I've really fallen in love with not only making music, but recording it and mixing it. It's really incredible that to hear you say that the computer is essentially your recording device. Because I, I was going to ask you how much of the music you make and the sound you create is in the box versus instruments in the room. And so I think you answered for me that the, you're taking advantage of the computer as a studio, but, or as a recorder, but not necessarily as an instrument. Yeah, that's exactly right. In some ways, I think I'm doing it in this very counterintuitive way where I'll be using a four track cassette recorder and that's just a mix of those four sounds and I'm happy with it. And then I'm just filtering that into the computer to try to capture what it is. Occasionally there's a little bit of EQing and some of those essential pieces that go just into navigating things I couldn't clear up ahead of time or making space, but there's very few especially on my solo stuff, there's very few sort of plug-ins and bits of the piece by itself. I've had to force myself to become slightly more savvy just in navigating folks recording live instruments and bits and pieces and putting it all together. We'll be back with more Spotlight On after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Do you ever record currently or in, in a group environment anymore, or is everything done through remote collaboration? It's mostly through re remote, which wasn't entirely intentional. I think on my solo stuff, it just was just me wanting to do it. And, and I do enjoy that, that for sure. I mean, the Peace Flag record, the first one, myself and John, who plays piano, and we've collaborated on a couple more ambient works earlier on, 
we just got together and he just literally tracked these few improvisations and, and what he did was what we built those tracks around. I think there was an intent in there. We did initially get some folks in the room and so much we all don't want to talk about COVID, that sort of happened. And so this time around, we like that process. I really like the freedom in that project that like the whole intent is let's let everyone lean into their own instincts and let's let them celebrate what's the best of what they do or the, what they want to put forward and share with us. And so this new record we have coming out this summer, there's some drums on it and we all got together and sat through it, but we actually weren't there when Mike tracked the drums. We just sat down with them after and kind of chatted through some ideas and stuff. I quite like that. I mean, in playing a different indie rock band delivery for years, like you're all in the room, you're working stuff out and either someone grows attached to something because you've heard it enough times and that's how it should be. Or someone has an idea that they come up with that they're excited about it. Maybe it doesn't best serve the song or whatever it is. And so the whole intent with that project is let's, we know all these people and I think they're all wildly imaginative, talented. Let's try to celebrate that. And then them all allow me the freedom to mess with it in some instances, sort of destroy some of those contributions after the fact. I think that those melodies, those ideas survived despite the fact that it may not sound like it did when they handed over those files. And so I'm certainly open to it. I, I'm excited. I've kind of been ruminating on this idea that I'd like to get in the room with some folks and, and sort of walk away with the record at the end of the day or two. But uh, I've also really enjoyed just to lose myself in headphones with someone else's creativity in that, in that project. So It's interesting that the idea of creating that distance in time from the sort of act of laying down your track and then getting your collaborators reaction and seeing what they did with it. It takes maybe some of the heat of the moment out of it in terms of you might not be open to your collaborator reacting or using your source material a certain way if you had to think about it and, re and respond in real time. But when something goes away for a while and comes back and you see what they did with it, that's almost more exciting than controversial, I, I, I would think. I hope so. I, I'm saying that in that I'm the one assembling this bits and pieces in that project. And so I'm excited about it. There's certainly there are things I could have never done on my own. Or I would have never thought to do on my own. And in this collaboration process with everyone that I work with, I really like using an input as an output, like taking something they've recorded and then sending that back through and processing and playing with it rather than, you know, it's sparking an idea and I can play it on an instrument, but it's far more fun to to see what I can build out of it. And it's really great. It's, it's nice to share it with everyone after the fact. And I think sometimes it takes a couple of lessons because it's not what you may have imagined, but it also, it, I think it, it's together and it feels coherent. And I think that everyone's ideas are equally messed with, for lack of a better word, sometimes, you know, <laughs> like it's not, a, it's not trying to hide anything that anyone's done. It's like, how do we build this cohesive little thing? And I think that it's done in a way that we could certainly get in a room and quickly figure out how to perform those songs and recreate it on the jazz side. My own stuff's a little trickier in some facets just because there's more layers and I have hands sometimes despite the fact that it sounds like next to nothing's happening. What if any role does humor play in what you do? I think a, a fairly substantial part of it, I can only take myself so seriously. It's not like a mad scientist project where I lock myself away believing that I have some brilliant idea or some brilliant scheme to, to concoct this thing. It's certainly not. It's just me and my personality, I think. I'm certainly not just a musician. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm moving towards the fully evolved or fully realized human in some capacities. But in that, I think that uh, the biggest part of it, I think I do rely on humor. And if hopefully it comes through sometimes in some song titles, particularly on the piece like record, is that here's a project and we played our hearts out a little bit, but also it's, we want to have fun with it. And I think that the music is equally playful and some facet. I, I was prompted to ask you that question because I was listening to Music for Listening. And the opening track, I think, is called No Rave. It, it just made me laugh. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was not a rave. There was no rave. <laughs> it was, it yeah, was this truly. beautiful, beautiful pastoral sound. And I said, this is definitely not a rave. <laughs> yeah, it's, in that record, it's really, it's field recordings and guitar. But the first one that I was working on, it, I built it around these generative synthesizer loops that I was playing with. And I made the record without telling anyone. I didn't even really realize I was making a record. It just came together and then felt a little bit accidental. But I just was, I kept telling everyone, you know, I've made this record that I'm going to put out and it's, it's an electronic record. And that's in my mind, that's what I was thinking because I was built around synthesizers and that was, uh, it was very misleading, which is, I think, again, why I lean to this context of trying to explain, not so much sell, but explain what the project is. And so it was really making fun of myself a little bit that I kept calling this electronic project when it truly, it wasn't. And it's, it's the farthest thing you can get from, from a rave, uh, you know, in a past life. I was the artistic director of a nonprofit 
organization and a venue that we ran it. And we would hold raves and no one else in town would have raves. So we'd have raves a few times a year. And it was just so far out of my, uh, my wheelhouse and my constitution to, to work these events all the time. And I certainly saw a, a beauty in it and it's exciting. And I feel like I've experienced that culture, which is not necessarily mine. And I can confidently say that my music is no rave. <laughs> I'm so glad I got it. I'm so glad I got the joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, a lot in a similar vein, what role do the titles play in the song? Do you compose to a title because you have a clever line in your head? Or do you, I, I love having this conversation with, especially with instrumental music makers. Some people have told me they don't even name the songs. They hand over a tape and somebody else does. Others start with very specific thematic inspiration because of song titles and everything in between. And I, I wonder where you sit. They come to me fairly early on in the process of each piece. Like it gets assigned a name. I'm horrible at file management. So often there's a dozen versions, version two, six, seven, and I'm trying to find the right one. But the name is sort of the piece that sticks. And in every project I've been involved in, I think, or most of the dozen bands you play with grown up and whatever, I was also the lyricist in a lot of those. And so I never sang in a band, but I always was tied to words. And I, so I have a hard time fully removing it. And I think it helps paint the picture maybe, or you can, using two or three words, you can tell a story or allow someone a little bit of insight where it's coming from. And so a song starts to feel like the title and I stick with the title and it helps shape, I think, what the song becomes in the end. The way your biography describes you, one of the things it says you are is a community builder. And I, I wonder, what does that mean in the context of what you do? That was a term that someone else used that certainly felt flattering to hear someone say that. And it stems from that I've been involved in the arts sector and the nonprofit world for all my, I guess all my life, really. Since leaving high school and working in jobs while I school go to university and those pieces. And, and it's about working to bring folks together, whether that's for a shared goal or a shared interest and or a shared goal. So sometimes where we were sort of the, the avenue in which folks who put on all ages shows, which I thought was such an integral part of the community where it's what will do that. And, and that's just really carried on. I think it's such an important part of it. Yeah. The truth is, I think organically it grew out of, I, I grew up and I had a group of really close friends and they were all like wildly creative and far more talented than I was. And I, I just found this intrinsic reward of helping them find success in what they were working towards. And I, that sort of just snowballed and you help folks out and they help you out. And then it became this notion of we can build this music community, we can build this and we can come together for fundraisers to help folks that may need help here or what have you. And it's been I guess it's sort of a career, but it's also been a, a hobby and a passion and all of those things subsequently tethered together. Do you see an opportunity or do you have an aspiration to present this material in a live setting? Like, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I've thought about it a couple of times in sort of fleeting, fleeting hopes and dreams in some capacity. I, I love the process that I'm going through right now, which I mean, certainly selfish, but I think that's where this project stem from. And I'm so grateful that some folks have taken an interest in it. I'm hopeful that if anyone's is sort of resonating or folks have connected with it, it's because it's coming from a place that is open to connection, if that makes sense. And I just in, in going back, like I, I like the idea of it. I think that it would translate nice on the right space, but I also am concerned of just sort of the feeling I had when I was performing <laughs> prior to going down this path. And so. I'm very open to it. I do suspect at some point I'll assemble different iterations of collaborators to perform it with me in different performances and not a fixed band, but certainly let's get together for a day, learn these songs in a way that feels presentable or this way. And, you know, I could do it with myself sitting on the floor with a couple of cassette players and the guitar pedals, but it's so quiet. Like it's not necessarily fully immersive. And, you know, sometimes you see some artists perform and it's like, Sonically, it's so immersive in this other way. And I'm not sure that I have the charismatic personality to just sit there peacefully and have people lost and on. I've seen folks do that. And that's not, that's not where I'm coming from this from. And so probably at some point I will, but the opportunity doesn't come along where it's like, okay, this is the thing where I really want to do it. And, you know, I'm grateful that again, the pandemic piece, people would reach out and fill me home concerts and those opportunities. And I'm super grateful, but it just was like, I just couldn't imagine setting up a webcam and me just kind of sitting at the coffee table, running all these lines pressing through buttons. and yeah, pressing buttons and shaking pine cones. And it's like, it makes sense when you put it on as a whole picture, but watching me do it just at home like that on the mid afternoon with my dog barking in the background, just didn't feel like the proper translation of what I'm trying to build. 
I have to tell you, there were points during the pandemic that were that might have been exactly what I needed. <laughs> I just oh. sit back and <laughs> watch a nice sound collage get created for me. <laughs> and if I'm honest, you know, I mean, there's certainly there's hundreds of artists that do that. I would have watched them do it for sure. And I just don't know why. I think it's maybe it goes back into the piece of humor and just I'm not something about my personality. I'm just not ready to, to be that person. You know, it's interesting. There are actually a couple of groups. I, I live in the Pacific Northwest. I'm just outside of Seattle. And there are a couple of groups that have been putting on events up and down the West Coast, basically in the major cities, presenting ambient and other, yeah, I guess essentially just ambient music in interesting settings like churches and other sort of atmospheric places and pairing the musician with light installations. So there is something to sort of, it's, it is a more immersive experience to your point. Absolutely. And it's not necessarily like film or screenings or anything like that. It's literally a sound design and taking advantage of the architecture of the room. And it's, it's incredibly powerful to witness and it looks beautiful. It's a great way to present ambient music. Absolutely, 100%. And I think the whole, the yeah, I mean, church world that they're doing, it certainly creates a beautiful, special moment, 100%. And I, perhaps on the flip side, even the, the leaving record scene in LA, and the, they do the thing where they just sort of gather and have artists perform in a park, it's like a park yeah. on a Sunday afternoon. And I think that equally is quite beautiful and a, a different experience, but also a very nice human way to, to take that in. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly very interested in all those pieces. And I'm actually in Vancouver, I'm from Saskatchewan, but I live and work in Vancouver. And so I do try to follow what all those, that world is happening down the West Coast for sure. And it's quite an exciting time musically. Yeah, it really is. There's so much talk about the emergence or re-emergence of the interest in ambient music and why now? And, you know, it's, it's a fascinating discussion. It's really fun to watch people try to experiment with presenting it live, not just in the conservatory setting, trying to make some kind of a spectacle or event of it a couple other things before i let you go do you use prompts at all like i think the classic of the oblique strategies deck or something like that but do you have any kind of game pieces or is there anything like that that you work with again going back to a rock band setting and rock band setting like we would play on the you know card sometimes in that realm with my own stuff honestly it's most of my prompts come from listening and what I just had really gone into collecting sound and, and field recording before I started making these records and just being in the world and listening in the world. That's really what triggers a lot of things for me is taking a walk or I, I go for, I go for runs quite frequently and we'll hear sounds and more often than not stop and record them and use that actual sound, what, whether it's like textural things of whatever that may be like something flapping against the chain link fans, then it, it's not a beautiful thing to see in the world, but the sound that it makes is quite quite lovely if you take the moment to hear it and, and tune into that. And so really I'm using sound prompts that I'm hearing elsewhere in the world more often than not sort of that directs a lot of what I'm doing and a lot of the, the sound I'm trying to make or recreate. And I've just found in this third record that's coming out, I've found through the process, the first one I had all these recordings of bicycles and just bicycles in Germany and they're running over cobblestone and they make this clicking sound. And that sort of became a percussive element that runs through that record. And then on the second one, I just, Somehow group compare, I had all these bird recordings, so I made the second record around the, the recording sort of lived and I played to them. And there's some strange film familiarity. And then this third one, there's like a similar sort of clicking with this rhythmic pace that happens. And it it was just sort of me with a guitar playing with pedals. And I found a sound and it I swept myself into a really tiny corner where I'm using a lot of a lot of the same sounds, but I'm 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 arriving at them in different ways. And then I'm like, oh, I love that sound, or this reminds me of this thing I did that I felt was successful. And so I'm making a lot of the same sounds in different ways, I guess is the point. And they, they mostly arrive from things I hear in the world. And then I either I use that and then I come to it from processing sounds. But That's something that I found very fun and enchanting as a listener, especially of the new record. It's not like it's a, a puzzle or a challenge to solve, more just observing that it's not necessarily obvious what's generating any given sound. Now, obviously there's, there are elements where you can hear the more guitar based sounds, but it's fun to get swept up in that and to be in a world that is comfortable, but also unfamiliar. There's an excitement in that, you know? That's what I find in a lot of music that I listen to. And so what I'm making is I'll often play a piece and I'll just steal like a, a tiny little moment that probably is the piece that should be edited out. 
but as a standalone little element, I think it, you know, it adds this sort of sonic curiosity that I, I'm very drawn to. And so, yeah, it's never really about taking a sound. I mean, using our process, I'm really just sort of running it through tape machines and pedals. And it's not really about making this big or nothing's getting bombastic by any means. It's often the opposite. How do I take this sound, this inherently sort of a large sounding thing, like a big piano, make it feel as tiny and frail or fragile as I can, but still communicate some element of emotion. And so, yeah, a lot of it's dissecting those sounds to do that. And the new record is the first time that I've had folks collaborate on it. And I intentionally, I didn't let anyone hear what anyone else had done. I just set them my sketches of the songs and had them all play. And then everyone was just open to me, completely dismantle whatever they sent. And so it's all been rearranged and cut up and chopped up. And again, it was that idea of what can I make this into? It's already something beautiful on its own. They've played these beautiful passages. I'm trying to allude to an idea of a passage without having to play it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Often it's like a two note calling it a melody, but it's just a two descending notes and your ear sort of leads you down that tumbling path to the time it happens to next. And so doing that with someone else, it sounds quite, quite fun and invigorating and in some sort of strange, strange, sad way for just a man with a cup of coffee and some headphones sitting at his desk. Do you feel an obligation to tell your collaborators in advance what you're going to do? Not specifically what you're going to do, but that when they receive a file back from you, they shouldn't expect to hear, say, that lick they played or the line they laid down, or are they willing collaborators in that regard, or do they have no idea what you're going to do? In this instance, they had no idea what I was going to do. And I actually haven't shown them the record yet. Like it's coming out next month. And so I just made it and I just kind of proceeded ahead. I, I think I got nervous. I mean, and so everyone I've invited, I know in different facets of this project and they're all great players and they mostly come from playing country world or they know they have projects that are certainly in the local direction or what have you. I was confident that I would just set them free and tell them kind of what I, you know, what I was thinking, not even musically, just for what I was thinking, what my inspiration was. And then I made it and I was like, oh, this is very different than what they sent me. And I think that they'll all find it curious, but I just was like, I just got to, I need to commit to sending it off or I'm going to, I'm going to bury it on my hard drive with all the other things I make that I bury down there. And the piece like record, it's, it's a very different process for sure, because everyone's sending me whole piece of that, that is their contribution to it. And I love that, you know, and so it's such a different thing for sure, where I'm trying to sonically show it together more so than build something. Yeah. I love the idea of the, how did you say it? The input as the output. Yeah. That's, I guess it's also a little selfish because it means I don't have to sit down and figure out what someone did. I can just literally take, take what they did and just twist some knobs and see what comes up. But yeah, I do think there's something to be like, we all know you learn what a sound is. This is a car horn. This is a trumpet. There's a piano. But I'm like, what, what are the other things that could be? You know, how can we take this and it can still resonate in that same thing or still carry that same melody, but become some, a sound that's familiar, but curious, right? And I'm really into that in like a dusty organic world versus like pop radio where everything is, uh, it's not a trumpet either, but it's like the most pure sort of sine wave of a computer algorithm role that a trumpet would be. And I'm really interested in how do we go the other way? How do we make this trumpet feel like it's falling out of the back of a truck and just rolling down the road, but also playing these notes. Yeah. Or what's that found sound that, ev that evokes a trumpet, but isn't actually yeah. a trumpet in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Truly, truly for sure. Yeah. Are you able to turn your hearing off? I think about when you say you're out in the world and you're finding sounds, is that an intentional act? Do you go sound hunting or are you bombarded with sound and is it a pleasant experience or is it burdensome i would certainly say it's pleasant I, i've always been just very curious about sound even as a kid i was making just little sound experiments nothing terribly musical but like literally splicing together tapes or playing things or figuring out how to play a tape back just the curiosity of sound and, and taking something familiar and messing with it like long before i ever thought of doing anything intentional with it it just was like he was a strange little kid in the basement and like dead stereo and me wrecking stuff and so now, you know, I mean, just sort of in an effort, I think, to be more present and a little more tuned in just in life and in the world and slow myself down a little bit and take better care of myself and my mental health. I find that sort of when I'm feeling my best or, you know, maybe be at my best, I'm more in tune with listening to sounds and being present. And if I leave the house and something's weighing on me or I got something I didn't get done or a deadline, whatever those things are in life that come your way, I, I, I'm less tuned in. And so... I'm more happy, certainly, when I can live and making this music certainly has allowed me, it's become an invitation to myself to remain more present and to mm -hmm. be listening more often and it keeps me more inspired to be in the world or take time and go for a walk with the dog and really just let her smell the flowers and I can listen to the birds. And it's like, 
a thing that I would have never imagined my teenage self doing. I think my grandmother is Victoria Karen's team in this, in this project, and, you know, she was every evening she lived on the farm. It's like after dinner, we'd just go for a walk up the road. And I, as a kid was like, like, where, like, where are you? Like, you're just walking down this dirt road in nowhere. Like, you know what I mean? I'm still like, oh, dusty and there's bugs. Like, where are you walking to? It just didn't make sense. And so now it's just sort of been allowing myself just to enjoy the world and what's happening around me. It's become so present. And so I can tune it up, but I've tried not to when I am tuning it up because I'm less present and less, I think, joyous and happy in life. Thank you so much for talking a bit about your process and what goes into making this beautiful music. And uh, knowing that the other contributors haven't heard it yet, and I have, makes me feel special for a couple of weeks. So thank you. <laughs> I won't tell Thanks. them. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I certainly haven't talked at all about this new the new record. And so it's, it's, it's a little awkward to do maybe in real time on a podcast, but also so grateful that you allowed me to collect my thoughts and share them with you today. So thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to seeing this music out in the wild soon. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael Scott Dawson. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purrier. Spotlight On is produced and edited by Michael Donaldson with theme music by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, to make a donation to support our production and to join our mailing list, visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch.